All right, hey everybody, how are you doing today? I hope pretty well. All right, right window up there for me. All right, well, let's just go ahead and get started because I want to try to finish up this project today. So somebody had asked me to make a simple board game in Unity, so um, that's, we're going to try to finish it up. Um, basically, yesterday we did most of the groundwork for it, and now we've gotten to the point where the game will set up all the information about the board and create um, a piece for each player on each of the starting spaces. So blue is for player one, um, red is for player two, and then they want to move all the way to the green space. And then here on we can look at the entities that exist and we have one for each space which basically just tell is there for um the space positions and then the, those are start spaces okay so that's all good although i noticed that there's not any or um any movement, which is a little surprising to me. So I need to check that out. Because I thought I did that yesterday, but maybe I messed something up. Um... Oh, okay. So it's just, yeah, I had clicked on a different system. So yeah, if we change the view to all entities and we can see these space movement entities which tell um, valid moves from one space to another. So that's what we've got set up now. Oh right, and yesterday I had to end my stream kind of abruptly because um, my internet had decided that it was all done uploading for the day. <laughs> I don't know what was going on, but um, I finished up that um, class, the piece model position sync that I had started and really all it does is just every frame it looks at each piece and sees what space it's on and then it tries to set the piece model position to correspond to that space. Um, we could obviously make it a lot more efficient by having it not update every frame but um, I don't really care at this point because um, even when it does update every frame we can look here on the entity de entity debugger. It will let us know how much time the processor spends on it. And it's really not too bad. It's only um, about 0.25 milliseconds. So, um, but yeah, if we wanted to fix it up, we could just have it uh, only update when there's a change, which we would just signal with an event or something, but not a huge deal at this point. Okay, so let's see. All right, so the start turn phase watcher is gonna checks to see when the pieces are set up and then um, changes from the initialization phase to the turn phase. And um, I have a little here that kind of just tells me the different phases of each turn. So first we'll want to initialize and then wait for input to roll the die, then roll the die, and then the game will want to find all possible moves. Wait for the player to make a choice, then it'll actually execute the move, check win and loss, and then if inconclusive, meaning no player has won or lost, then it'll start over for the next player. But then if somebody's won, then it'll go to results. So first up, um, we could just have the game automatically roll the dice, but I think it'd feel a little better if we at least had some button to press. So I'm going to just kind of um, set up a really simple UI. Let's see. So we'll create just a button. And I 
Let's get a little bit more fancy here and put um, some text out to the side of it. What am I looking for? Yeah, panel. Okay, so I want this panel to have a horizontal layout group so that it will place the button and then um, a label that I'm just about to create. in order. All right, so right now it takes up the whole screen, which we don't really want. Okay. Don't want to force expand. All right, yeah, just messing with those buttons. So, okay, so let's, um, Let's have it not stretch or anything. So we'll just have it on the bottom left corner and then let's just give it a width of 200 and then a height of, I don't know, 24 to start with. And then, okay, so we can set a spacing here. Let's put eight pixels between them and we'll put no, we don't want it middle, we want it left. Okay, I don't want to spend too long on this, obviously, because I do need to focus on the rest of the game. Okay, and then so for the button, it needs to have... Also, I think, yeah, a horizontal layout group so that it will... size itself to the text inside. And the text should have... Well, yeah, I always get a little confused. about how some of this works. So I thought that the text would set its width and height automatically. You can kind of, you can switch to the layout properties down here on this bottom. Okay, so it says the preferred width and height here. So I guess it's not automatically picking that up. Okay, maybe I don't really want to mess around with trying to make this fancy right now. Okay. Yeah, let's just do it this the easy way. Um, so yeah, let's not even just use layout groups. I'll just kind of... Um, how come this worked then? Because I thought that I, if I put the horizontal layout group here... Then it would automatically size it up. Let's see. Layout properties. Yeah, so it has a preferred width and height. I guess the panel isn't. Okay, so I had to yes yeah, click this child control child size. Which to me is a little weird wording because it seems like the child sets its own size, but anyway. So then let's give it a bit of some padding on the button. Okay, so it's not liking that because the panel is not high enough. Okay, there we go. So now if I just put roll die there, okay. we got it to work. So player one. Alright, 
so now we can look in game and see this over in the corner. So yeah, when we play, we'll actually we'll click this die when it's our turn to roll. I guess we should have another text that would have the actual like um, result. Okay, let's just put that. All right, so there we go. Got that set up. So let's um, go ahead and create flow component. So this will be the turn. Um, do we need to do any initialization? I don't really think so. We just need to wait for the player to roll the dice. So um, die roll and put wait phase. And then here where we first enter the turn phase, we'll also just go ahead and enter the input wait phase. Okay, and then we'll have something else that will basically just wait for that button to be pressed and then we'll um, mess with the components on this entity. So let's just make, um, I'm going to try to make this a little bit simple, and we'll just have one class that will deal with all the UI. If you wanted to expand this game, you'd probably want to split this up. I need to try and make better templates. I bet that would speed up this process a little bit. Okay, so we want to have a link to the button for sure. So this will be the die button. It's all right. And then we'll want to have a link to the text so that we can change the player so we got text, this will be player turn text, and then we'll have the die roll result text. Okay, um, so now we just need to wait for certain events. Um, maybe we'll just have another system that will do that. All right, um, I'm just trying to think about how I want to handle this. Let's make this the um, die roll wait initialization system. And this will just be a component system. And... Okay, yeah, it's complaining because I need to implement the update function. So probably what I want to do, now that I'm thinking about it, is I want some class to update these text or this information right when the um, like right when we start the um, die roll phase so probably I want to actually have another um, flow component in between these that will just be the die roll initialization phase and basically, it's just going to be a one frame phase, but the system will update the text and then um, change to the next phase. Uh, let's private void set 
to um and then we'll go ahead and give it the player um not the id we want to give it the player number okay so the button oh we don't need to do anything for that the player turn text we want to set that text to um, player player number turn and then the die result text we want to set that text to just some default And uh, okay, so this should be public because this initialization system will actually um, call this function. So on, yeah, we want to override the on create, and there we'll get a reference to the UI manager, which we can just use the game object find object of type which just searches the scene for a UI manager. And this works because we only have one scene in the game, so we know it will be loaded by this point. And then we also want to require um, singleton for update, and then we need the um, die roll initialization phase component to exist somewhere on a uh, entity. So when that happens, we can call yeah, so what this means is that we require this component to exist somewhere in the system, and Unity will only call on update if that's true. So if that system exists, we know that we should initialize the dice roll or die rolling because there's only one. Um, the player number. Okay, so in order to get that, we need to figure out what player is active. Um, and I think to know that. That information should be on the turn phase. So public int active player. Okay, so to get that, we need to get a reference to that class. And we know that there's only going to be one turn phase. So we can just use this helper function that Unity has created, which is uh, get singleton so this works because we know that there's only going to be one um, instance of this component in the system so unity has this helper function you can call so that you don't have to make your own query for it that's pretty nice okay and the player number is the id plus one yeah Okay, what else do I need to do? Oh, right, I need to remove the initialization phase tag and then tell it that we're now in the um, Yeah, we're now waiting for input from the player. Oh yeah, and so this is complaining because I need to tell it what entity to add and remove those components from, and that is this singleton entity that I set up to um, contain all these different flow components, just so they'll all be on the same place. Um, and I think that's all I have to do here. Let's um, go ahead and set this up. This actually... And then I need to set the player ID on the turn phase. Okay, so for now I'm just going to set the player ID to zero. We'll need to watch this. Because we'll always start with the first player. That's okay. If I really wanted to, I could have it be random who starts. But let's make it easy for now. Okay. Doing this, you know, I realized that I could have finished this game a lot faster. 
if I didn't use the entity system. But the entity system, I think, I still need some practice, so I still think it's worth it to maybe take a little bit of time. But I've been trying to think of ways that you could maybe speed it up. Okay, so this player one turn is correct, but I wonder... It actually didn't change because I have it... set up like this already, so I kind of want to just put that in there for now. Oh, also... This button should probably be disabled. Can I disable it from here? I'm not sure. Also... Oh yeah, I should have gotten... Yeah, I just realized... I should have got a null reference exception because nothing has the UI manager script on it yet. So let's go ahead and set that up. I really should rename these objects. So let's do that real quick. This will be the player turn text. And this is the die roll button. This will be a little bit neater. Okay, so on the UI manager also, we might as well on start, because when the game first starts, you can't roll the dice, so I'm going to set this to disabled. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, I also want to actually want to set interactable to false. And then here, I'll set that to true. Okay, and... I guess let's just check this real quick. Well, the text there is not happy. I don't know if you can hear that, but sorry, there's this dog that's been barking all day. Okay, so it did update. Player one turn and then button. I can click on it. Okay, so next we want to... I guess we want to actually listen for the player to click that button and then roll the dice. Okay, so what we'll do is... I guess we will want to have another function, but really what we want to do is subscribe to the event. Yeah, okay, on click. And then we'll add a listener. Let's just say on die roll button click. Okay. So when this happens, we'll want to basically just insert a component into the entity system that says that the button's been clicked. That component should delete itself at the end of the frame if it's not used, but I think I won't worry about that bug right now unless it comes to bite us. But let's see. Um, so we'll want to get world. Could just add it to the singleton entity. But I think it feels better to me, especially if we're going to treat it as an event, that we just create an entity. Um, so let's make another component, and this will be... Start. Let's actually call this um, a message. And what's going to happen is the UI manager will create an entity with that type. Um, oops, not create system. Oh yeah, I have to get entity manager and then create entity and I'll need to pass it an archetype. I think we should create 
Or we, um... Get to this function on the start. Um, start function, we should create this archetype. So it's, that's just world default entity manager. Create archetype, and the only type will be that message. Oh, I need to pass the archetype, and that's really all we have to do. So now an entity will be created with this die roll message um, component attached. So now what we want to do is have a function or a system that waits for that message to exist. So this will be die roll message watcher. And again, this will just be a component system because we're not going to use... Oh. We're not going to be using jobs for this. Alright, so again, I'm going to start with the create function because we're going to need to set up some queries. Okay, so first I'm going to get a query to query for the events. Or let's not call it event, I guess message. And then the message query will be get entity query. And this will just be a simple one. Um, I guess I should do the read only thing. So component type. Oh, switch that to lowercase again. And that's really all we care about. And then we also want to make sure that we're in the right phase. So this is die roll wait phase. Oh, also, I need to tell this to update in group type of um, initialization system group. This just tells Unity when to update this group. Because it creates three different groups for systems, the initialization, simulation, and presentation. And they kind of correspond to um, start, update, and um, late update for mono behaviors. Okay, so and then again we need to require for update. So what this means is that this system will only update when an entity with this component exists and this query has more than one entity inside of it. So what we want to do here is, first we just want to delete um, all the uh, messages because we don't really need them. And then we want to remove the um, die roll input wait phase from the uh, command entity. And then we'll want to add the next phase to it, but... Alright, so... We want to also roll the dice. We could just, like, have a random number generated right here in this function, but... The bad thing about that is that if we ever wanted to have like an animation to roll the dice, we couldn't uh, just... Well, obviously we couldn't if we roll the dice at this point. Well, I mean, I guess we still could, but... Yeah, I'm just trying to think about how I want to do this. Um, well, we're going to want to have uh, some component to hold the dice. The die roll. Um, this is what I'm looking for. Let's close a bunch of these tabs. Okay. 
So let's just have a struct. So the next phase, I guess, will be um, let me see. So yeah, we roll the dice, and then we have to find possible moves, and then wait for the player choice. Okay, so really, all this is kind of like internal. So the next real phase would be wait for player choice. So we need something in between them. So I guess let's have bigger moves. Okay, so we can do that. Okay, so let's just make a really simple system that just rolls the dice. So this will be roll dice system. Well, we only have one die, so. Namespace, game logic. So all this is really going to do is just call Unity's um, random number generator to generate a number between 1 and 6. Usually randomness is kind of a pain in um, the entity system because it's hard to make us a, um, a random sequence when you're doing multi-threaded jobs, but we're not really going to have to worry about this that for this game because the only random um, aspect of it is the dice roll. Okay, so what this is going to do is we want it to run when the figure moves phase is active, but only if the die hasn't been rolled yet. Okay, so let's... And this will just have, um, I guess, just results. So we'll want it to only run, again, if the turn figure moves phase is active, but there's no entities that have the die roll result. So in order to do that, first I'll require singleton for update, which is just the figure moves phase. And then we'll want to get um, an entity query, which actually I don't really have to keep a reference to it because we're not going to use it in the update. So, um, require for update and then get entity query. And this will be a bit more uh, in depth. So, we have to create an entity query description class. And what we want to look for. Oh, actually, wait. Yeah, you can't really check to just see if a... Uh... Entity doesn't exist. Yeah, you can't check to make sure that no entities exist by default. So what I could do is either have a separate move phase for this. Maybe that's the easiest thing to do. I was kind of trying to avoid it. Okay, so we'll just have... Um, I guess just die roll result phase, where we actually do the dice roll. And then we won't have this other um, query. So yeah, when this is active, then we'll just roll the dice. So what I want to do is first create an entity for the dice roll. Um, create entity. Oh yeah, I need the archetype. So 
this will just be um, archetype. So the die result archetype is entity manager, create archetype. And again, it's pretty simple. It's just the die roll result. And we'll pass this archetype through. All right, and then we want to get the actual random number. I'm just going to use the old Unity Engine random number generator. So we'll tell it to give us a number between 1 and 6. I can't remember if that means it won't include 6. So return a random integer between the minimum inclusive and the max exclusive. Okay, so that means it returns something that's greater than or equal to 1 but less than 6. So we actually want something between 1 and 6, so we just need to add 1 to it. Um, and then in the post update commands, we'll tell it to set component. And so here it uses the function set component and not set component data. So it's not very consistent. Okay, and also while I'm here, I'm just going to have this class deal with changing the flow um, components. And then it will change to uh, the figure moves phase. All oh, right, I need to give it the command singleton. Okay, and then this should update in group. Does it really matter? I guess just simulation since it does do something. Okay, so let's go ahead and test this. See if we get this um, die roll result function in the entity system. Did I... Oh, I think I forgot here. Yeah, it's still... Okay, I actually messed this up because it removes and then adds the same thing. So what I actually want to do here is tell it to go to the result phase. Um, I guess this class could also update the UI. Let's just go ahead and do that. Set die result. It'd be better if the UI would update itself by watching for the entity, but um, again, I don't have a ton of time here. Also, I should have this immediately um, exit die wait phase. So I want this to immediately disable the die roll button. And then this would be the result text. It's pretty simple. Okay, so here I want to tell the UI manager to immediately um, disable the button so the user can click again. Yeah, really the UI manager could probably do that itself when it's clicked, but Um, and then UI set. 
Oh, that should have been exit, not in it. And then in the die roll system. Oop. Then we'll just say UI. Oh, I guess we have to have the result already, so. Oh yeah, because this is called the random number. All right. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that. Well, I mean, it's fine. If we have time, I might go and make the UI a little smarter, because it would be better if the UI basically can find everything out on its own through events that the game creates, so that that way the game doesn't actually have to worry about what the UI does. That's usually a lot better because UI, then it, the UI is like separate from the game. Okay, so let's see if that works. Right. Okay. So a player one turn. Click the button. Okay, and it did roll a two. I didn't get any error. So let's look. Okay, and then there is an entity with the dice roll result of two. Okay, so I think everything is set up there. All right. So what's next? We need to figure out all the possible moves that a player can make. So that is going to be a bit, probably one of the more complicated algorithms on this project. So figure moves system. Okay, and again, I think, do I want this to be a job? Um, yeah, let's do it as a job. That way we can practice with jobs a little more. Oops, yeah, I didn't want to rename it. Okay, so what this, basically the algorithm is going to be First, we find this, what position that the player is on, and then from there we kind of do a search through the movement tree defined by those um, movement entities until we reach um, every possible space that's the dice roll away from the position. So we kind of are going to do like a depth first search. Um, kind of might be a, a bit more complicated to do that multi-threaded, but it is. I'm not sure if it's possible in jobs because you have to do um. Like the queue system, so I might we might not do this multi-threaded, but that's all right. First, I'll have a job. That'll just be the depth first searcher. Oh, uh, let's. I don't know, we don't really have to be super specific there. And we'll just tag it as an eye job, which just means this job doesn't try to be multi threaded or anything, it just runs once on its own thread. Uh, what will we pass to it? So we'll need the start position. Um, so this will be read only. I guess we really don't need to set read only and everything because again, it's not really going to be multi-threaded, but 
Okay, uh, so start space. And then we'll want to have an array of all possible moves. What did I call this? It was like a space move. Yeah, so moves. And then we'll want to know the um, the move length, which is the dice roll, basically. And that's about it. Alright, so let's see, um, do I have anything else? Well, let's start programming it, I guess. So this class will actually need... So if you do a depth first search, basically what it works, or how it works, is you um, move to every neighbor that you have on your, on your space. And then if the neighbor has been visited already, then you don't want to visit it again. But actually, in this case, we do want to visit it again because you could go on a loop if you wanted. But um, So yeah, we won't worry about that. But anyway, you place every neighbor that you can reach onto um, a queue, and then you loop again and execute the same thing for the the next object on the queue. So we'll have native queue. Um, and I guess it'd just be an integer because, well, no, it'll be, it need to be a little more an int two because we'll have the uh, both the position and then the length so far. Oh right, and so this should be new, and we have to pass it how we're going to allocate it, which will just be a temp. And then I'm going to go ahead and remember to dispose of it after, when this function's over. Okay, um, so we are while. State. Um, okay, how does this work? So, oh yeah, it's try DQ. So this returns false if the queue is empty, but returns true if there's more information on the queue and then sets it to the state. First, let's go ahead and add the initial state. So that'd be the start space and then the move length. Okay, so... Okay, one other thing we need here is the max... Oh, actually, okay, so the this move length will be the max, so we actually start with it being zero. So if... Let me see. Let's do this. So space ID equals state X, and then at move length is y. So if the at move length is greater than or equal to the move length. Just for my sanity, I think I'll rename this to um, the max move length. Then we want to stop here because this is one of the spaces that the player can move to. Um, so let's see how we do that. I think I'll have another. Can I do? Yeah, I think I can just have a native list. So this will be final spaces. And we'll just add elements to this list for every um, final space that they can move to. So. Um, no, that's not what we want to do. We want to add the space ID. Okay, so that's good. Otherwise, 
We'll want to search for every neighbor. And also, okay, so if this space has no neighbors, this will also be a final space. So we'll need to keep track of that too. So num neighbors found. Okay, so for int, um, I guess I, let's do something like this. Less than the moves length. Oh, actually, a neighbor index is not the right term. It should be a move index. Okay, so if the move index from is equal to this space. So it's um, moves move index dot from equals the space ID. Then the next space is actually a neighbor. So we want to add that to the queue. So in queue. Yeah, the two and then the move length would be R move length plus one. Okay, um, and then we'd also want to increment the num neighbors found. And then down here, if num neighbors found is zero, then we'll want to add this space as a final space. So this is all good, but I want to clean this up a little bit. Let's see. Extract method and just, uh, but then I'm gonna have to pass the queue. Well, it's not really, is that a bad thing? Okay, let's say find and in queue neighbors. Does the queue have to be a reference? I don't think so. Uh, but we'll leave it because I guess it is a, um, a structure and not a class. But then I don't really need to get a reference return to this. I can just return that actual number. Okay, so that's a little bit cleaner. Um, I think I'm going to do one other thing and just say extract method add final space. Just since we have duplicated code there, even though it was just one line. Okay, so I think this looks like a, a lot cleaner. Alright, so now we have to actually queue the job. So what do we need here? So we need to get the start space, the max move length. Well, the start space tells me that I need to get the piece for this player. The max move length tells me I need to get the dice roll result. Um, the moves tells me I need, I need to get um, information about every move. So I'm going to need a query for that. And then final spaces, I don't have to do anything special for. Let's see. So private. I'll need an entity query for the, the move query. And then we'll override the on create function. Um, I also will need an entity query for the pieces, I just realized. Because we'll need to get a player piece. And in order to do that, we'll just need to get all the pieces. If I can spell it right, I think that. 
works. So the piece query, and again, an entity query just looks for every entity in the system or in Unity that um, has the specific components that we're looking for. So this one will just want to get type of piece. So pretty simple. And then the move query will just want to get same thing, but type of space move. And then we want to make sure that both of these exist. Well, I guess technically these do have to exist, but I don't know how they could not. If there's no moves and no pieces, then we've clearly made a mistake. But we do want to require the phase singleton. So figure turn figure moves phase. Okay, so this will update whenever this phase is active. Um, okay, so first we need to find the start space. So we want to get all the pieces out of that query. Do component data array. All right, and this has to be a temp job. So we're just going to look through the pieces until we find the one that corresponds to the active player. And the active player we can get from get singleton, turn phase, and then active player. So for int 0, less than pieces length. So if pieces p dot player equals active player, then we'll okay, so then start space. Let's just leave that. And then start space equals pieces p space, and then we can break. So. One thing that could happen here, I can see, is that there's no piece with this active player, but we would have messed up something at some point for that to happen. So again, since we don't have a lot of time, I don't want to worry about every single edge case. Um, okay, so now we can go ahead and create the search for worker job. Oh, actually, we're not quite ready yet, but okay, because we also need to get a list of moves. Good job, and what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to ask for it to give me a job handle, which means it will delay filling out this data until, well, it's basically we'll go and do it out on a different um, thread. Because we don't need this data in the update function, we're just going to need it in the searcher worker. So this will be move query dependencies. And then I also need to get the max move length, which is the the dice. So should I just assume that there's one dice roll? Because then I can just use get singleton. Um, I guess I'll do that. So I always forget to do this, so I'm going to go ahead and dispose of um, the moves and pieces, so that way it won't complain to me later. Alright, so now we have that, and we have the max move length, and we have the moves 
Oh, actually, yeah, we don't want to dispose moves here. We want to dispose of them when we're done with this job. So we'll do that in just a second. Um, okay, and then we need this native list for the final spaces. So I'm just going to create it here. New native list. Um, and usually we won't have a whole lot. Okay, yeah, I ask you to give it a uh, initial capacity. I'm just gonna say four because usually we won't. There won't be that many final choices. All right, so now we can pass that through. Okay, and we'll schedule this. And we, it needs to run um, after both the input dependencies and this move query dependencies are finished. So in order to combine them, you can just call job handle combine, combine dependencies. And that's done. All right, so now we can go ahead and dispose of the moves array once this job is done. And to do that, you can just call dispose and then pass it a uh, dependency. Um, yeah, so we actually want to pass it this, which is returned after this worker is scheduled. All right, and so now we have a list of all the final spaces, but nothing else can use it right now because it's all stored in here. So I want to have another job that will take this list and then create entities about it. So let's call this entity creation worker. And then this can just be another I job. And the reason that this is separate is because I can optimize this job to work a lot faster if it doesn't have to worry about creating entities, which I'll show you. Um, once we finish writing all this and testing it. So again, if I want to create entities in a job, I just need to get an entity command buffer. And this doesn't need to be concurrent because this job just runs um, in one thread. And then I also need to pass it the list. Not right. List um final spaces. And basically just for each final space we'll want to create some entity. Um which I don't have the component or the archetype ready yet, but only public entity archetype. So let's just call this the archetype. All right, and let's go to components. So I guess this will just be struct uh, turn move choice. And we can just pass it the space ID. All right, so buffer dot Create entity, and then we'll pass it the archetype. And then we need to set the data. So set component E, and then new, um, what was it? Turn move choice. And space ID equals final spaces I. Okay, and I think that's it for this worker. So up here we need to schedule that now. So dependencies equals new uh, creation worker. And we'll pass it the final spaces list, and then the other stuff which we haven't set up yet. 
All right, so in order to give it the command buffer and then the archetype, I just need to create them up here. So this will be a final space archetype. And to make an entity command buffer, we first need to get a reference to the system that we want to um, execute that buffer at a later time. Entity manager, create archetype. Type of turns, move choice. Okay, and the, I want this buffer to run. Let's have it run at the beginning of the next frame. So, this would be world, get existing system, world, um, let's begin initialization. And yeah, now that. That makes me remember I need to tell this to update in the simulation phase. Okay, so now I have that all set up. So I can pass it the archetype. It's not going to give me the... The variable name for me. And then the buffer is just the buffer system, and we tell it to create a command buffer. So, one thing you have to do after that, well, let's schedule this first, I guess. Um, so, this just needs to run after the other worker. Let's clean this up. We don't need pieces after that. Okay, so the buffer system, we have to tell it to wait to. Um, execute the commands in the buffer until this job is finished. So we just call that function and pass it the, the dependencies. And then we also want to tell the final spaces um, list to dispose of itself after this is run. So we'll do that. Um, and then we just need to return these dependencies so Unity can pass them on to the next system. And I think that's it. Okay, so I can't test this just yet, because if I do it now, it's going to run every frame and spit out a ton of entities. So I need to have another system that will watch for the moves to be um, created and then change the phase component. Um, I guess moves, figured, watcher. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just copy the other watcher class um, right here so I don't have to type quite so much because it's going to be about the same thing. Right, and then I need to update our using namespaces. Okay, so all I have to do here is instead of querying for pieces, we'll query for um, turn moves. Um, do I even need this query? I don't think so. so I'll just simplify this. And instead of the initialization phase, we'll want to wait for the figure moves phase. And then we'll remove that, and then we'll add in the next uh, phase, which would be, um, I guess, the initialization of the pick move phase. So. Um, or do I need to do that, or can I just move right to the pick move phase? Um, I guess I don't really know yet, so we'll figure that out in a second. Okay, 
So I think now we're ready to test. And so it's done compiling. Okay, we're making pretty good time. Now we've got a... Um, so we figured out the move spaces, but of course they're not visualized yet. So I need to um, deal with that. And then I need... to um, yeah, visualize, I'm oh, sorry, I'm repeating myself. I need to visualize the um, possible moves by just creating something on the scene. And then I need to be able to pick which move I want to choose. And then I need to actually do the move. So I hope we'll be close to finishing if we don't finish today. Okay, so now I just need to roll the dice. Alright, okay, we got an error. The native container has been declared read only and you're writing to it. Oh, I think I realized that while I was programming, but I forgot to change it. So yeah, so this final spaces list doesn't need to be tagged read only because we're actually writing to it, which was um, a silly mistake on my end. Um, these, that can be read only. I think that was the only problem. Yeah, these are all the same error. I'll put collapse back on. Okay, these are slightly different, but they both are pointing to line 91, so... Okay, let's try it again. Okay, so no errors. We rolled a 1. Let's look and see. Okay, so we have one cho move point. Sorry, move choice, which is space 5. Um, which hopefully would be this space right here since we only moved a 1. But let's look and see. Okay, okay so that is ID 5, so that worked well. Let's try it one more time. Hopefully we'll get a number besides 1. Oh, we got one again, of course. Okay, that time we got three. Oh, that's good, because I think we'll be able to get to the branching path. So it just said space three. Is that right? So one. Oh, okay, yeah. So we have to get a four or more to get to this branching path. But at least the ID was correct. Um, okay, I'm just going to try it one more time to see if we'll get a four, five, or six. If not, um, I'm sure we'll get to test it at some point. Well, if not, actually, I'll just go and edit the code so it ro rolls a six. Okay, there's a four. Yeah, and it gave us two, base ID six, okay, which is the to the left, and then space ID zero, which is to the right. Okay, so that worked. I've programmed depth first search enough. I'm glad it worked the first try. Okay, so what I'm going to do, you can tag a job as burst compile which um, will have Unity compile it with an extra uh, faster compiler. Um, but like I said, it can't handle command buffers and a couple other things, so you have to be a little careful if you want to use it, but it should make this code run even faster, which is nice. I don't know if it will actually matter for this project, but... Um, okay, so next we need... Yeah, so let's try and visualize the choices, and I think what I'm going to do is just 
anyone you can move to will have like a floating sphere above it. Um, so, yeah, I was hoping that there was maybe a pyramid, but I mean, if I wanted to, I could try to be a little bit more fancy. Let's create an empty game object. And parrot parent the sphere to it. That's zero zero zero. And first I'm gonna make this sphere smaller. Move it up a little bit. Okay, let's give it some color. Um I don't really want it to copy the color of one of these other ones, so let's make it I don't know, purple or something. This will be move, choice, sphere. All right, so now it's purple. Might be a little small now. Okay, and then what we're gonna want to do is have like a, um, like an invisible collider because what how I'm gonna do this is I'll do a ray cast from the mouse that will um, hover over this um, element that we want to choose to move to. Will be um, move voice, and yeah, this is gonna need to be a prefab, so we'll just go ahead and create it. Everything has spaces instead of camel case, so. Um, right, I guess. Move this back up. Okay, and I'm going to create a 3D object. Um, I guess a cube. And I'm going to remove the, uh, oh no, it does have a box collider, okay. I'm going to remove the mesh components, because we just want to be left with this collider. Okay, um, I mean it doesn't really need to have the part underneath, but it doesn't actually matter, I don't think. So we'll leave it like this, and if it is an issue, then we can try and change it. Let's go ahead and move it up a little bit and then maybe shrink the, the height. I think that will be a little better. Alright, and then I want to apply the changes to the prefab. Okay. So now I'm going to want to have some class that I can uh, keep track of all these choice objects. Let's go ahead and create an empty thing. So this will be move choices. And kind of like I did for pieces, I'm going to just have a, a choice registry that will have different, um, I guess, a list of all the alive choices. So move choice visualizer registry. Uh, I guess it should just be, not the visualizer, it should just be the visual registry or something. Okay, and namespace game logic. This will be a mono behavior. I don't think I'll need to have a start. Okay, so I'm going to have a list of alive. Um, visualizers. I guess I, I'll call it visible. Well, they would be visible visuals. I don't really want that. So let's call it active visuals. And then, uh, well, no, let's just make it even more simple. I was going to say I'll have like a cache of visuals that aren't currently active. But let's just create and destroy the game objects as needed. It's going to be fine. Right, and then 
on a wake. I'll just create this list. That shouldn't be private, it should be public. And then I want to have a, a reference to the prefab. Okay, so it's piece model position sync. Do we wanna we can do something like that? Oh I'll have a creator. Well the creator okay, so this the these visualizers will never move. So we can kind of just combine the creator and the position synchronizer into one. Okay, and probably for ease of use, we should attach an ID to each choice. Let's go ahead and do that. Space I, well, I mean, I guess technically, well, I don't know. We might have more than one choice on the same space if it's a more complicated game. So let's just go ahead and just add an ID. It'll be cleaner this way, I think. Starting to get lots of objects active. Okay, so I'm gonna add um, move choice visual creator. And I'm going to just take this piece model creator and copy it. Okay, and so the game piece registry will want the move uh, choice visual registry. And instead of a piece query, we'll want uh, the choice query, which we'll use to get all um, move choices. And this should be move choice. There we go. Oh, I didn't rename this, so... Um, okay, um, I think this is fine. So, yeah, we get... This is getting all the pieces. We don't want pieces, we want move choices. We actually will want the translations, but let's worry about that later. So the prefab is really doesn't change, so it's just the prefab. Oh, it's set to private. Um, don't really want. Okay. Yeah, and then this is. Yeah, I complained that we didn't really have to do this, but... Well, do... The ID in the list doesn't really need to match, does it? Okay, well, let's um, worry about that later. I think we might need to add a mono behavior to these visuals models so that we can put the ID on them. So we can worry about that. So anyway, we just add the model here, and then we want to add presented to this entity. Uh, but do I really need to do that? Because we okay. Yeah, we just have to pick move face. Okay, that's fine. All right, so now we need to set the position. Um, we don't need that at this point. Okay, so the position first. So it's going to be positioned over the space, so we need to basically get um, a query for the spaces.
which I'll just copy some code over so I don't have to write it again. So we're kind of just like combining these two different classes. So then we'll get a reference to the space and their positions. Let's rename this to a uh, choice entities. Okay, I won't need that. Okay, and then I want to go ahead and dispose of the spaces and their translations. Okay, and then here I'll copy this code, which just searches through the list of spaces for one that matches. Uh, I'm going to put this as a different function. Well, I'll have to like copy the stuff over. Well, that's probably okay. So we don't need to search like that. I guess there's only one for loop, so it's not too confusing. So if this equals choices i space id then this model transform will equal the position for that space space position okay so that should work let's go ahead and test it Take a little bit to compile. All right, so move choices. I need to add that registry class and then give it the prefab. And I think that's really all I have to do. Everything else should just run. But let's see if it does. Right, so we'll roll. Okay, yeah, we rolled a one, and then it did put a choice over the space. So, cool, that worked. Let's try it one more time. I don't. I keep rolling ones. It seems like. <laughs> okay, that time it gave me a three. Yeah, and it did place it on position three. All right. So next up. Well, first, I think I should move the camera so we can actually see the board better. Um, but we want to do the mouse picking with the camera so we can actually choose where to move. Probably. I want to do some kind of feedback. That's, I guess, if we have more time. Let's see. Um, let's start with the camera. I like to have a camera anchor object. Put it at the center and then parent the camera to that. And so that's good. Um, and then, we, then you can just rotate the anchor around. Let's drag the game out. No, I don't want it. There we go. Alright, I guess first of all, we should move this into a more central location. I want to rotate it that way. Something like that is fine. I mean, again, we probably will want to. The game needs a lot of polish. <laughs> but now at least we can see what's going on in the game screen. Right. 
that was so good. Uh, good so far. Oh, there was an error. Um, manage class type. Native cube block pull data. Oh, I didn't notice that. Okay, so I think this is complaining that queues aren't supported by uh, the burst compiler. Okay, so I can't have burst compile, which is a shame. Um, that's okay. I mean, it's not a huge deal. If I wanted to make it work, I would have to prob probably change it to use a list or an array, which would be kind of a pain, so I'm not going to worry about it. Anyway, um, all right, so we move the camera. Let's do the part that will cast rays from the camera. So mouse ray caster. This will just be a mono behavior, I guess. I could make it a system. But I think this will be fine. Probably what we'll do is we'll have some other system. Well, maybe this will um, insert data into the the world whenever you click on top of a an object. So, um, void update. What do we need here? Well, we want to um, raycast from the mouse. So, in order to do that, you have to be able to change from screen coordinates to world coordinates. And to do that, we need the camera. Um, so I guess this will just be main camera and most of the work is done with this. So camera, screen, oh, screen point to ray. An array just gives a starting position and then a direction. So you want to give it a world, I mean, a position and screen space, which this is a little confusing because if you just put in um, input dot mouse position, you think that would work. But if you, there's something on the camera called the near clip plane, which is kind of like the minimum distance from the camera that the camera will pick up anything. And if your screen point is inside the near clip plane, then it won't, um, it won't return any meaningful information. So we have to basically make sure it's outside of this. So, um, can I just do, right, let's Mouse position equals input dot mouse position, and then we'll want to return or not return. Transform this x y, and then main camera near clip plane. I think this will work. Let's try it out. Um, I could do even better. Let's, I think there's a draw ray. Yeah. I should rename this variable though. This is the world ray. Um, okay, that's kind of funny. You can't just pass it a uh, actual ray object. That's fine. Um, I'll do red. Right, and I'll just add this to the camera anchor. Oh, 
I still have an error? Oh, yeah, I'm missing uh, ending parentheses there. Okay, letting it recompile. Load it up. Okay, so we can't see the test right here because it only shows in the scene view. So if I move this out, Oh, you can see it, but it's actually kind of small. But yeah, you can... Up here on the top of the screen, you can see the little red line from the camera. And you can vaguely tell it's pointing in the right direction, but... It would have been a little better if... Does it have... Can I pass it a length or something? Color, duration, depth, test. So yeah, let's just use the good old draw line. Um, I need to give this an end point, so I can do that just by worldray.origin plus the direction, and let's just make it 10 meter or 10 units. Just gotta compile everything again. Where'd my... I accidentally... I think I, uh... Oh, there it is. I was gonna say, where's the game screen? Alright. So this... Let's see if we can... I mean, I guess it's kind of hard to tell, but... but pointing at the green. But it's still not long enough. Yeah, you can see when I mouse over it, now it's in the middle of that space. So it looks like it is working. Oh, but yeah, it needs to be even longer than that. Okay, so now what we'll want to do is... Well, I guess we really only have to... Um... Raycast when the mouse is pressed because we only really need to see what what happens when um oh I'm trying to say like we only need to see if we're over something when the user clicks but I kind of like to have some feedback when you mouse over a choice like have the circle change color or something. So I think I might leave it in the update so that we can um, add that functionality in easy or easily. So if, but yeah, so let's just add clicking now. So get mouse button down. So this is, this function is called whenever the mouse button zero is first pressed. Um, so zero is left click. Um, Okay, so yeah, we'll leave this here. So we want to ray cast. Um, so we got result equals physics ray cast. Okay, so I can't just give it the world ray and then the max distance. I guess I should put this as a serializable field. And private layer mask. So you do this so that you can only um, raycast against certain objects in the scene if you have other colliders. Um, so max distance and then layer mask. OK, 
Okay, so what I'm also going to do here is f result dot. Oh, is that just a boolean? Hmm, I want more information than that. Um, how do you get? Oh, yeah, the rake hat. Rake has to hit. It's a little strange, but it works. Okay, so yeah, if this is true, that means we hit something. So, um, set the debug color. Okay, if we don't hit something, let's just have this as gray. And then if we do hit something, I'll set it to red. That'll just help us debug gray casting a little bit. All right, so if we click and we've hit something, then for now I'm just going to print out the name of the object. Um, which actually, the collider is a child. Um, so it's just going to say collider. I guess it would just say Well, it would, it would have copies, wouldn't it? So, yeah, let's get the parent form, parent name object name. Okay, that works. So, yeah, if we click and there's a result, then we'll print out the name of the object. Oh, yeah, so we need to do a little bit more with the... Um, layer masks before I actually test it. So you go to, is it physics? Oh, tags and layers. So we just need to name one of the layers. This will just be um, move choice. And then I need to in the prefab set the Lighter to have the move choice layer. All right. Oh, it's still not done yet. I need to actually set that information in the mono behavior. Okay, so the max distance, let's set it to 20. Then the mask, we just want to have it set to move choice only. Okay, well, get low on time again, but well, let's see. I don't want to skip by something important just to make time, so. Anyway, so let's check ray casting. Yeah, it should stay gray all the time because we're. It's not going to hit any colliders, but yeah, it seems to match up. And then if I roll the dice and then mouse over that, okay, it does change to red. Thankfully, so that means it's hitting that object. And then click on it, yes, yeah, so and then it says move choice clone. But at least we are. Um, it is working. Alright, so now what we actually want to do, instead of just doing that, we'll want to add in a component. Basically the um, information, or it'll have the choice ID. So in order to do that, I need to store the choice ID on the mono behavior. So this will be move choice ID tag. Logic. All right, and this will just be a public int ID, and that's all for that. Um, and then I need to set that tag in the model creator. Oh, also, 
one other thing I forgot to do here, but I'll do it in just a second. Um, so model get component model ID tag. Oh wait, it's move choice ID tag. So we're gonna get the old mono behavior component and just set the ID to. Uh... Oh wait, this is the wrong thing. This is the the piece creator and not the move choice creator. This will equal choices i dot id. So now these are linked. And also, before we go creating things, we need to destroy all the old uh, move choices. Uh, well, okay, let's not do it here. We'll just destroy them when we exit the phase. Some other class will take care of that. Um, anyway. Um, oh yeah, um, this prefab, I need to add that tag component to it. And let's just have it default to negative one. Um, and then the raycaster needs to insert a component with that ID. So I'll need to create that component up here. This will be struct, turn, move, player, input. I guess that's fine. Public, and chosen. <laughs> chosen choice, that sounds bad. Let's put chosen move choice is fine. Alright, so now we've got to get the entity manager, so I'm going to need it a couple times. This world. No, I want to get the entity world. Which I probably don't use that namespace yet, but default. Entity manager. So uh, message entity equals entity manager. Uh, create entity, and I do need to pass the archetype. Private entity archetype message archetype. Right, so the message archetype equals entity manager and then create archetype and this is just gonna have that one function, so what was it? Player input there we go. And so then I need the entity manager to also set that data. Okay, and then we need to get that, which I don't know yet, but we'll do it in a second. Also, I always forget to pass the archetype, so I'm going to do that now. So we need to get this ID for the choice, and all we have to do is hit collider, transform parent, get component, uh, ID tag, ID. <laughs> so this would be the choice ID. And again, this is kind of a lot of assumptions about the um, that's the word, like the architecture of how this game object works. It might be a little better to do something like get component and parent. I forget that that exists. So that way we don't know exactly what parent this mono behavior exists in. All right. So I think this is good. Let's go ahead and try it out. Okay. And then after this, I mean, 
pretty much we finished all the interesting parts. After this, we just need to move the player to the space, clean up all the data, and then start the next turn. So I don't think I'm going to get that done in five minutes, so I might just do it off stream and then show it at the beginning of next stream. Gosh, I keep rolling a one. That almost seems like a bug. But anyway, so we'll click. And now let's check the entity debugger to see if that entity exists. Okay, yeah, so the move player input, and it says chosen move choice of zero, which we can see. Um, this move choice has an ID of zero, so that checks out. If we do click again, it's going to keep creating them, which is a problem but it doesn't actually matter at this point. Okay, so I'm glad that worked. So now we're gonna need another system, basically the same as we did for the dice roll that watches for this input. So do I have that? This will be move, choice, uh, message, watcher. Well, we didn't call it a message, we called it input. So move, choice, input, watcher. And I'm going to just copy the dice roll one. Choice, message, watcher. I don't really need the UI, I don't think. So the query... Yeah, this is... I just decided I call it input. Okay, so this is the player... Turn move player input. Um, this will only run during the... Did I do the phase, actually? Turn pick move phase is what it's called. Okay. So basically... Well, no, I don't want to destroy this entity yet. I just want to watch to make sure that they exist. So I guess I don't need to actually see the query. And what this will do is just... Pick... Wait, what am I doing? Okay, um, yeah, I want to remove this and go to the next one. Which I guess just moves the space and then cleans up information, so... Let's do it. Let's split those up. So, yeah, we'll have the... Struct. Turn. Move. Piece. Phase. And again, we could insert some kind of animation between here if we wanted to pretty easily. And then turn clean up phase. Which will just clean up all the data from this turn and then hand off to the next player. Um, yeah, so we want to add turn move piece phase okay so i'd like to try to move the piece real quick so i'm gonna try to we also are gonna need to have something that will clean up the component like the move choice objects but i'm gonna worry about that later so i can show this the t um, piece movement so move Piece. Uh, let's call this the piece mover, actually. Do I already have that? Oh, I have the position synchronizer. I don't have the piece mover yet. I think after this, we've done for sure the lion's share of the game. And all I have to do is just delete unneeded um, 
components left over, like the dice roll and any move choices, and clean up the move choice visualizers, and then hand off the face to the next player, which is just setting that turn phase variable to the next active player. So we probably won't do that on stream, but I'll take a few minutes and finish it up off stream and then just show it off. Um, but yeah, I think we can at least do this part. So we move, all we have to do is find the piece for the specific player and then set its space to the um, chosen move. So I need quite a bit of entities here. Entity query. We'll need a piece query to get all the pieces. And then I'll need an entity query for um, move choices. And then I'll need one more for the um, player input query. Let's just grab all the data we need right here. To component data array. Uh, yeah, and then I need to give it the temp job. Um, and then choices. To component data array. Um, okay, and then the player input. And again, this just pulls out um, all the components of the specific type from the query. Okay, so what I have to do is first I need to find so we're going to just get the uh, the chosen move from the player input. And I, I'm just going to use whatever is the first player input. If there's more, um, that's kind of um, it's the bug. Well, not a bug, really. We'll just, won't, we'll just disregard it. Okay, so this is the move ID. And then we need to find that specific, like the space corresponding to that choice. And then set the piece data to that. Uh, setting data is always a little difficult because you can't just do it. Um, okay, let's actually do this in a job now that I think about it. Because if it's in a job... Yeah. Because if it's in a job, you have better access to the information you want to change. I could just do it in a post update command. Then I'd have to get the entity. I mean, it doesn't really matter that much. But I guess a job is better since it's multi threaded. Okay, so struct set position worker. And this will be an I job for each. And really, we just need a piece. Okay, and what other information we'll need is kind of this information that I set up here. First, we'll need a native array of all choices. Oh, what is it? Turn move choice. And then also this player input. I could just pass in the first information in there, but if we do it like this, we can have um, it fetch that information um, in a separate thread using the dependencies, so might as well do it like this. And then I also need to get the active player ID. Um, okay, so let's try that.
Okay, so if piece is not the active player ID, then we can just kind of disregard it. This is a little... Uh, maybe I should have done it as a post-update command, but... I've already committed to this, so... I mean, this is one way you could do it. You could also just do uh, post... Update commands and then set component for and then get the entity corresponding to that piece and set the position. Anyway, so we have that. Let's have private void find space from choice. For it, I. 0i less than choices length. So if choices i id equals choice id, then we'll return choices i dot space. Otherwise, we return. Well, this should never happen, but we'll just return 0. I guess negative one, and we'll say that if it's negative one, then we'll just, we won't move, so. Our space ID equals find space from choice, and then we'll just take the first input. And then if space ID is greater than or equal to zero, then we can set the piece dot space to space ID. And this works because this information is passed through as a reference. Active player ID can also be read only. Yeah, I just thought that the Z didn't look right. Okay, so now what I need to do. Oh, yeah, so this I need to return a job handle. And I also get a job handle passed to me. All right, so dependencies equals new set position worker, and we'll pass it the choices and input and the active player ID equals um, get singleton turn phase active player, and then we'll just schedule this. Okay, so we want this to run after choices and player input has been filled out and also the input dependencies. So job handle dot combine. Oh, yeah, so I need to switch this out now. Out variable choice query depths. Okay, and then we'll just combine those dependencies together, which means this job will run after all these other jobs. All right, so now we also need to have the choices array dispose after this job and the player input array dispose after this job, and then we'll just return the dependencies. Okay, so that should have the piece move. Um, oh yeah, so I need to do the override on create so we can create these queries real quick. Choice query equals get entity query type of turn choice and then player input query is get entity query type of turn move player input. And then we also want to require or update the turn move piece phase. So really, after, well, we need to wait until this um, actually runs. So we'll have to have some message or something 
so that the system will know when to advance to the next phase. But I just won't worry about that right now. So this is going to run every frame, just setting the space over and over, but that doesn't actually cause any problems. We won't want that to happen in the final game, obviously, but let's just check to see if this works. And if it does, I'll have to sign off for today, and I'll probably just finish this in my free time tonight. Because we're almost done, and I want to move on for next stream, but we'll see. Okay, so yeah, now we have two options. Let's move here. Okay, um, well that didn't work. Oh, what happened there? Oh. Hey, Tim Rustwick. Thanks for the, the host. I really appreciate it. Just making a, a board game. I actually only have a few minutes left to stream, but it's nice of you all to come by. Hi, Shiny Deagle. All right, so let's look. So I clicked. I expected the piece to move to this spot, but it didn't. So I figure I probably forgot something. Let's look. What's the board game? It's gonna be, uh, well, somebody had asked me to make a simple board game in Unity, so really, it's not any game that actually exists. All I'm doing now is just trying to um, have this pace move to this position. So it's pretty, like I said, pretty simple. I'm just trying to um, show how you'd build something using Unity's entity system. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. <laughs> I'm sure no city. All right, um, okay, so let's see, the player move choice, actually, okay, so it chose position zero, which is what I expected. Oh, yeah, choice, it's going to have the choice zero, which is that one, is that right? Is it always zero? Okay, so it's always zero, so that shows me something is wrong there. <laughs> it's alright, Tim, I don't mind. I really do appreciate you guys coming by. Um, let me see. Alright, so... Did I forget? No, I did pass it through. Let's go ahead and log it. Gotta recompile. So now I can see what Unity thinks it's setting there. Because when I, no matter which choice I picked, it always gave ID zero, which shouldn't be what shows up there. And I'm going to go ahead and just have the dice always set to five because yeah, I need to check, uh, test branching paths. Ended the stream like 15 minutes ago, but I thanks Ben Buswick and Flex Flux Oblivion for following me. That's really nice of you. All right, let's try this one more time. So yeah, we roll. Okay, well this is a little. 
Oh, I see what happened. Okay. I was going to say, why'd that show three? But it's because I passed this number, but the system actually always is set to five. Um, probably. Well, I won't do it while it's running, but to handle this better, I should have set this variable to five, but whatever. Um, okay, so I click here. It sets a player input. to zero, but this ID, okay, well that's right, and then zero there. So what happens when I click on the other one? Okay, so it's saying they're both at zero, which is kind of weird to me, because the IDs, oh wait, they are both zero. Oh, you know what, I think Back when we moved the, or when I created the the move choices, where is that? Yeah, so it's setting the ID correctly, but I think that the ID is always set to zero, and the um, the turn move choice objects, because I forgot to actually assign them an ID. Um, where is it? On stream, it's, this is my always my uh, biggest problem is trying to read this list. There we go. Okay, so figure move system. Yeah, so down here I needed to assign an ID, which I can just this isn't um, executed um, asynchronously, so I can just increment a variable. All right, but also okay, well, I should have tested that before I'm making it compile again, but um, also the piece wasn't moving up to the space, so I'm not sure what was going on there. Did I probably forgot to change the phase at some point, but the easiest way to test that is just to run it again. Um, okay, so again, I hard-coded it to always roll a 5. Let's check here. So, yeah, that's, this has ID 0, and this one has ID 1, which is what I was hoping for. So, yeah, it prints out 1. But, yeah, the piece should move there immediately, so obviously I have forgot to link something else up. Let's look. Okay, so it's, yeah, it's staying on the pick move phase. Did I, I thought I created a, something to move out of that. Yes, yeah, so a move choice input watcher. Oh, yeah, so it removes the component and then adds it again. So this should change to um, move piece phase. And I think that will move the piece up to the position. All right. Um, all right. So I click here. Okay, there it goes. And I can't move again because yeah it's a different phase okay so finally a couple of silly mistakes but we got there okay so now right now it's stuck in the uh, piece move piece phase but all I have to do is create another system that basically just waits a frame and then sets this to like the cleanup phase and then it will clean up all the data that we got that we set up to move the piece yes definitely progress and um, then I need to hand off the turn to the next player but 
Unfortunately, I'm already running 20 minutes over, so I better stop here. But yeah, it's just a little bit more work, and this prototype will be done. So I hope that it's uh, has been useful to somebody. I have it's good practice with the entity system in Unity anyway. But yeah, I better get going. So yeah, thanks everybody for coming by, and sorry for the raiders that <laughs> you only got to watch five minutes, but bad luck on my part. Um, but I will be back tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, and I'll probably just show off the completed prototype here, and then I'll be back to my main project, which is um, a Twitch interactive card game. Uh, thanks, Faxwer, for following me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Flex Oblivion. You have a good night, too. Um, but the Twitch interactive card game is kind of like the old game uh, Concentration or Memory, where you try to find matches of cards that have been turned face down. And the fun thing about that is that people will get to vote which card to reveal in chat, and the pictures will have the players are. I guess viewers' icons on them, so I think that'll be pretty fun. Yeah, hey, hi, Faxfer. But anyway, um, I'll put some links in chat if you're interested in that. And yeah, I guess that's about it. So again, thanks everybody for coming by, and hope to see you tomorrow. Bye bye.